It's hard to believe it's been two years plus since Sandy Hook. A lot of productive work's been done since. What a horrifying, horrifying moment that was. There are no words that I can use to, uh, to do any better in describing it, uh, so I won't bother. But I will tell you that Michelle Gay may have some words to describe it. She is a mom who lost her little one in that horrendous school shooting that um, seems like yesterday and a little bit long ago. She's been doing some very constructive work on school safety through a program called Safe and Sound, and she is my special guest this evening, and I'm looking forward to having you meet her and uh, we'll talk about the work that she is trying to accomplish. So welcome into my state of mind. I am Dan York. Thank you so much for watching. Let's go to the rundown and check out what's happening here. Um, this has got to be one of the most confounding and alarming stories over something that is hard to defend, right? It's kind of weird. Uh, that's the new term from the Republican senator for our commander in chief over Cuba. Uh, only in Rhode Island do we write a script where this kind of thing pans out. I'll explain that. And uh, a nice moment today is CVS kicks in that much from a couple of rounds of golf. And, of course, we'll check in with your state of mind before we meet our guests. So let's dig in. This is a wacky deal, isn't it? The headline uh, talks about the movie, the interview. You know, when I first saw some of the movie previews, the trailers, whatever, I thought, what kind of a wacky scheme is this? Uh, it's a comedy about killing the, uh, the boss, the young boss, the controversial family, Kim Jong-un. It's a real guy. So the movie is about plotting to kill a real guy. Here's what CBS kind of notes over the whole thing. Movie theaters took down posters for the interview after Sony Pictures announced it is scrapping the release of the controversial film. We're going! The James Franco Seth Rogen film centers around an assassination plot to kill the leader of North Korea. But after threats surfaced of a 9 11 style attack on theaters showing the film, theater chains said they wouldn't show it. Finally, Sony bowed to pressure. CBS News has learned federal investigators could soon blame North Korea for the cyber attack. Of course, the, the pressure is from reportedly North Carolina, North Carolina, North Korea, been a long week already. Uh, North Korea, and uh, we're soon going to learn formally that they are the source of the cyber attacks against the company, which have cost the company about $100 million so far. The movie is about $80 million in between the making and the marketing, and now it's on the shelf. Who knows if that will ever change? Most likely it will not. It'll become like this cult movie, people getting a, a hold of it somehow, uh, you know, and watching it on the black market. It's a fascinating conversation. A lot of ideologues will try to pin the president on this one and say, there he goes, back and down again. But this is a company, you know, held in Japan, operated in America, publicly held, privately run. It's not a government entity. And remember, there are theaters that just didn't want the exposure to actually distribute and play the movie so that you could walk in defiant for America and watch a movie about killing a dictator. You know, there's a lot of defense for First Amendment that you can, you know, put your American flag on. I'm not so sure that this is one of them. It's a complicated, complicated conversation. But one thing is for sure, our cybersecurity, yikes. Next item. Uh, so that's what Marco Rubio wants to call him. Headlines in the Washington Times, uh, the Florida senator. Uh, says all that about the president. This is all about the Cuban deal. I noted last night that in my entire lifetime I've never had, as an American citizen, a open relationship with Cuba. Cuba. I was born in March of 61 and January of 61. We started this problem with them based on what happened with the Bay of Pigs and at all. You know this history, right? Now, uh, a lot of folks are really happy that we're opening up communications, perhaps commerce, with Cuba. At the top are cigars but the senator from Florida, not so much. This president is the single worst negotiator we have had in the White House in my lifetime, who has basically given the Cuban government everything it asked for and received no assurances of any advances in democracy and freedom in return. Yeah, he makes a point. You know, we're going to open up all of this conversation with the Secretary of State. We're going to get Havana all opened up here. That is, if Congress approves. Remember, the Republican Congress is going to have to approve these expenditures, and there's going to be a significant debate that will occur. But, you know, the idea that we are incentivizing right now the Cuban government uh, 
to treat his people better, for a better humanitarian environment there, seems to be lost on me and Senator Rubio. I'm trying to figure this whole thing out. Now, granted, for 50 years, it hasn't improved much. I'm not sure what this does to help it yet. We'll all stay tuned, I guess, and enjoy our cigars as they come over in limited amounts. Ugh. This is unbelievable, this story. I mean, how this whole thing is rolled out, I'll just let the, uh, I'll let the headline and the story told by Eyewitness News and Target 12 kind of stand on its own. In a Superior Court ruling Wednesday, Judge Daniel Procassini found Secretary of State Ralph Mollis' office abused the judicial system for political reasons. During Mollis' campaign and his failed bid for lieutenant governor, the legal counsel for the Secretary of State's office, Mark Welch, filed a petition in Superior Court to allow the Secretary of State's office to conduct depositions of those involved in 38 studios but then withdrew the petition a month later after heavy criticism from Michael Corso's attorney. Judge Procassini says he was convinced the petition was filed, quote, to make it appear to the public that Secretary Mollis was aggressively addressing Mr. Corso's involvement in 38 studios, only to abandon and dismiss it as soon as the possibility of sanctions for such an utterly inappropriate filing were suggested. The judge noted Mollis didn't begin any proceeding until confronted by the media. In May, Mollis launched the investigation into possible lobbying violations after Target 12 revealed that no one from Kurt Schilling's video game company registered with the state. Mollis says he is disappointed by the judge's decision, saying, quote, It both mischaracterizes my attorney's actions and rewards someone who fought to keep 38 Studios lobbying activities secret from the people of Rhode Island. But Corso's attorney says Mollis and his lawyer made an illegal political move and got caught by a judge who won't tolerate having the court politicized, saying, quote, he should consider himself lucky that all he lost was an election. He is a complete disgrace to the state of Rhode Island and the public is well rid of him. <laughs> you know, only in Rhode Island can we write a script where we actually, through this ridiculous exercise by the Secretary of State, who was caught grandstanding here in his investigation, only in Rhode Island can we make the villain in the 38 Studios case a victim, or one of the villains. Uh, this Michael Corso is certainly at the core of the negotiations in this whole thing, and I, I find it just incredible that we're in this place. We don't have any idea of what the state police are doing in terms of an investigation in this case, and, I, and you just get a headache when you think about it. It is amazing. All Ralph Mollis. Uh, he, he, listen, when the Secretary of State ends up being the entity that's investigating any aspect of 38 Studios, you know that this thing is completely off-center. But it has been from the beginning, when our legislature was duped by leadership into creating the financing for that project. All right. Let's go. <laughs> Just crazy, man. And um, better news. There was an event today at the CVS headquarters where they announced another $1.4 million. There's Brad Faxon and Billy Andrade next to Larry Merlo, the chairman of, the, uh, of CVS, the CEO. Uh, nice. $18 million they have raised over the last 16 years for very needy causes and charities here in the state. And Brad Faxon uh, made an interesting political comment during the event and talked about the idea that there are too many charities that are now without budget money from the state that this thing has got to help, this wonderful project, this golf tournament has got to help. Um, he also had a political comment for new leadership and uh, Gina Raimondo, our governor-elect, he's bullish on her and says, give her some room. You have a, a person here that's certainly uh, capable, smart enough, uh, savvy enough. I think she's got the balls to really make a difference here in a state that really needs to have a difference made. <laughs> you know, and I know that there's opposition to a lot of the things that she said, but I think, you know, stay out of her way for a while and, and let her get some stuff done. It's actually a conversation that Brad and I had over at CVS this morning, and um, she absolutely gets a honeymoon period. She's got to make the most of it, though, uh, no doubt. All right, uh, your state of mind, just let me know what you're thinking. 228-1886, state of mind at myrtv.com, Facebook post and tweet. Uh, because I'm going to rush to my guests, we'll see what you have to say tomorrow about all of this. Stay with us.
You know, I don't think I could have had this conversation, frankly, when it happened. It was so devastating. I, as a parent, it, it was the, the most horrifying thing in the world, and I'm not in a contest for, of superlatives when it came to the parent reaction to this. Here's the headline, um, uh, weren't they? Uh, it was an unspeakable time. I, the, the radio show, I didn't have to say anything, and so the phone lines ripped, and all people did was cry. I, that, that, that's all we, we did. It was just... Right, so here's some um, really productive stuff that Michelle, who you're going to meet here formally in a second, has done. Here's a little clip of Safe and Sound, the project that she's working on. The women's shared experience combined with their growing friendship and led them to create what they call Safe and Sound. And then we got stuck on school security. And, um, you know, can you believe this? And how come nobody's talking about this? How come the conversations are about this and this and this, but nobody's saying, what are we doing about sending our kids to school tomorrow? Amen. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Merry Thanks Christmas. Thanks for having me. Um, it's nice. I'm not that far away from you, so. No. 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 I, you, my condolences. I. Thank you. I I don't, when is that's never going to be inappropriate? I don't think so. I mean, we're going to carry this loss with us for the rest of our lives here. Uh, two years feels like what? You know, sometimes it feels like it was just yesterday um, or a couple minutes ago, and sometimes it feels like it was a lifetime ago. Um, missing her, it seems like an eternity for us. Joey. Yep. Uh, special kid. Mm, very, very. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about her. So Joey was seven, um, and she was a special needs child. She had autism and apraxia, and um, she had a really sparkling personality and was incredibly affectionate and very loved by her teachers and her classmates and, and the whole town. I mean, she grew up, she spent her entire lifetime in Newtown and loved it. It was a wonderful place to grow up. So, um, by the way, we're going to have a further show. I'll tell you in the next segment, we're going to have a, an additional conversation about, about the concepts of safe and sound schools because I don't think we can accomplish this and since in, in just one, in one show. And since Michelle's been kind enough to, to hang out for our recording in the afternoon, uh, we'll have more. We can talk more about what happened that day. I, I'm in the uncomfortable place of actually asking permission about talking about this because I, I'm so sensitive to, to a parent's consciousness about having to do it. And I bet you it's different for you every day in terms it of is. how you talk you about know, it. You know, minute by minute, it's, it's different. Um, sometimes I feel pretty strong, like I've you know, mm -hmm. found my feet. And then, you know, 10 minutes later, not so much. Uh, as much as you can bear, that day, what? Yeah, so I think, it, I think it is, you know, you were asking me, is it okay to talk about it? I think it's important to because, as you were kind of alluding to, the nation's hearts were broken that day. It, it didn't just deeply affect us. Um, it affected everyone. It was so close to home, you know, even if you were in California hearing it on the news. Um, and I think it's unthinkable and unimaginable. So I think it is important to share the story. So for us, it was like any other day. My, um, my husband was already living in Massachusetts because he was taking on a new job there and we were to move a month later. And uh, it was Friday, so we were super excited. He'd be coming, you know, home Friday night. And uh, we had a birthday party celebrated, you know, planned to celebrate for Joey's birthday the next day, Saturday. So, you know, the usual fights to break up between the siblings and the lunches to pack and, you know, Joey's gluten-free, casein-free, fun-free lunch and breakfast, all of those things that were a part of our normal routine. Um, and I sent off the two older girls. They, they went off on their buses. One went to the intermediate school in town and the other went to Sandy Hook where she was a fourth grader. But I held on to Joey a little bit longer that morning because she was still recovering from a concussion that she had suffered on the playground. So I was really 50-50 on whether I was going to send her in that day. Oh. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I said to her, you know, after a little extra snuggling on the couch and having canceled her, her special bus, um, I had said, do you want to go in? And she immediately jumped right off the couch, grabbed her lunchbox and her backpack and her jacket, and she wanted to go. And so I figured, you know what? She goes, spends a little time there. I'm sure you know, her teachers will call me if she's, if she's not up for it. And, uh, and I can come pick her up you know, early if I need to. So we hopped in the car, and we went off for another fun day at Sandy Hook School. Um, you know, the holidays were right around the corner. They had activities planned. and. You know, it was 
it was something exciting. And she was met at the door by one of her favorite teachers, and they skipped on in together, and that was the last time that I saw her alive. And, and, and you know the rest. When we come back, we'll talk about this great project. Stay with us. This is Josephine Gay's playground. Everyone knew her as Joey. She was among the 20 children killed by a suicidal mass shooter inside Sandy Hook Elementary. What do you yeah. think when you, as you look around and see it for the first it's time? It's unbelievable and it, it's beautiful. It's part of a program born of two disasters, Hurricane Sandy and the Sandy Hook Massacre. New playgrounds in the memory of each Sandy Hook victim in areas affected by the superstorm. This one in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Great project, you know, all due respect to the journalist there or the narrator. Uh, that the perky reference to the idea that a child was lost and it, 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 it you must just you just must glaze over uh, when we've you see become this stuff. desensitized you know so um, you know we we had to learn even being a very private family that it was important to to speak up to be involved particularly if we wanted to shine light on on the work that we're doing for Joey's fund and for safe right. and sound so um, you know, you, you learn to recognize people's good intentions and focus on that. Sure. Okay. Uh, again, Jess, I forgot to ask you, what night is this um, next show going to air? Uh, the Tuesday before New Year's. Tuesday before New Year's. When we come back in the next segment, I'll give the exact time and date as we expand this conversation. Uh, You've got two things going on. The Autism Project is obviously terrific, and that resonates with a lot of people. That's a, that's a, that. There's too many kids that, that have autism. Um, I want to park that for a second, touch on it in the next show maybe. The Safe and Sound program, though, is really important. What is your gut call on what we're doing for school safety, and what is your mission? So the mission is to empower and educate school communities across the country. And, and every, every community, every building, every classroom is is going to be completely different. We're all like snowflakes real in reality. So it's important for us to develop a framework for folks and, and to help them get the discussions going, to give them the resources that, that we know are available and are out there, but just aren't really seeping down to the level that they need to be. Um, but it's important that we, we teach people to fish, that, that in, in their local communities, they're taught how to put together their own initiatives, how to drive their own initiatives, and that they reflect the, the values and the culture of the community that's putting them forth. Okay. What does it mean? We want to help people make their schools safer. Okay. I don't think we're doing enough. I can't figure out why we have armed police officers in Rhode Island's middle schools and high schools known as resource officers or dare officers and we don't have armed officers in the schools for what we consider to be and boy we heard a lot of it after this horrifying incident our precious cargo thought in terms of why we don't have SROs in our elementary schools hmm. and it's one element of the conversation it is and it's but only I find one. it to be horrifying that we can't figure out how to get that done and we think that the master plans that towns have run through and the state's kind of approved and we're going to keep it all quiet because we don't want to give the bad guys the idea right, and all right. that kind of stuff all misses a point mm -hmm. which is uh, just well it, everybody it, really does have to be involved in the plan and and when you take that route y y you totally miss the boat we have to have the parents involved the students involved the teachers the custodians People need to know what the plan is, and they need to have confidence in it. They need to have a, a, a say in drafting it. They need to be a part of it and, and to, to weigh in and say, you know, this is really bothering me. I notice that the cafeteria back door is open all the time. It's great that we have an SRO. Right. It's great that we have locked front doors. It's great that we have a panic button now. But I'm noticing this. And those types of things get kind of dropped through the cracks when you don't have all of those stakeholders involved and vested and educated in what the plan is. Yeah, here in Rhode Island, we're, we're keeping the plan quiet. Mm -hmm. it, it's a, it's a behind-the-scenes document. So the thing is... I, 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 you know, I conceptually debate this with the superintendent of our state police, who's a, a phenomenal law enforcement officer, yeah. but come on, man. 
this so this is uncharted ahead. territory, though. This mm -hmm. is this is not like the success we've had with fire safety, where you know you can just lay it all out on the table and you can tell everybody when you hear this sound, this is what 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 it means. Uh, you should respond in these three ways. This is a bit different because people people are looking at it like, okay, should it be top secret? Should you know we don't want to put our blueprints out you know on the internet so that the next mentally ill young man might you know take advantage of them and there's some truth to that so there has to be a balance but we don't have to give out you know the alarm codes and we don't have to give out you know highly right. sensitive information to parents and teachers and students to empower them they can be educated on on the basics like we, we don't you know many of our staff members in schools are CPR trained we don't really take the, the young students through that whole program and, and show them what it looks like if someone is in, in duress, but they have confidence that we know the plan and that we're trained. For, for this segment, and we're out of time for tonight, but what, what is, uh, what, what do people learn from your work? If you go to the website, yeah. they, we are a us. hub of resources. So we have national experts in school safety and security. We draft tools and resource kits for communities to tap into print off, it's all for free, and take into their communities to get their own initiative started. And it's started. Safe and Sound, there it is, it was safe right there up on the screen, Safe and Sound. SafeandSoundSchools.org. Right. Mm -hmm. um, no words, but boy, you're some making a constructive project out of this. I have to, I have to, I feel, I feel like that's what she wants me to do. One more thing and we come back, we'll tell you about this next show too. We'll continue the conversation with Michelle on Tuesday the 30th, all right? So between the holidays, uh, a brand new program. Uh, tomorrow night, Tenny Gross from the Institute for the Practice of Nonviolence. There's been a lot, another shooting in Providence again today. And uh, obviously there's a lot of conversation about law enforcement and how it deals with the public, Ferguson, Staten Island, et al. So that will be our conversation tomorrow. We'll see you on the radio at noon on WPRO. You have a great night tonight.